Thank you. So I'd like to actually to start with uh, with a story. It's a story about uh, a, an attack that happened here in the U.S. Uh, this summer. Um, the target was a, a, um, a famous consumer credit reporting reporting agency here, um, and the attack really started with uh, with a simple vulnerability in the Apache Struts module. Um, what we typically see when, when such vulnerabilities are being published is that they open a window of opportunity for the attacker to leverage that specific vulnerability. In this case, it took four days for um, the attackers to realize that um, there is a vulnerable server. And when they realized that the vulnerable server belongs to that famous uh, agency, um, at that point in time, they basically handed that information to a much more uh, um, skilled team. And that, that team actually leveraged that vulnerable server um, as a pivot, and they find their way into the deepest databases of that agency. The result was that they extracted a lot of, uh, a lot of information. And actually, if you live here in the US, there is close to 50% chance that um, your most sensitive, sensitive information, such as uh, um, your social security numbers, your credit card numbers, your name and address, your family numbers, are in the hands of the attackers. Um, no one really knows who the attacker is, but the fact that this information has not been uh, used so far makes a lot of, makes a lot of people um, believe that the attackers are actually a foreign state, and um, we don't know when, are, when they are going to use that, uh, um, uh, that information to create havoc here. Um, my name is Ido. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. My name is Ido, Ido Breger, and um, I've been in, this, uh, in the web application firewall market for more than uh, 15 years basically since that market started. Uh, back then, we had to explain um, the market and the customers, what is an SQL injection, why it's dangerous, what is cross-site scripting. But today, um, the majority of the enterprises um, use web application firewall. They use them because they realize that they need them just like that they need uh, network firewalls. Um, F5. Um, F5, we are known, you know, the, the roots of the company started with a load balancing um, market, but uh, over the last uh, decade, we have been uh, um, investing more and more in uh, uh, developing our security solutions. And this year, Gartner named our web application firewall as the, uh, the leading WAF in the web application firewall magic quadrant. Um, so we're going to talk today about, and we're going to discuss how vulnerable we are uh, um, how web application firewall can protect you. Um, I'm going to, to share with you a few best practices, how to deploy WAF. Um, I'm going to share some uh, use cases that we see our customers use, how they use uh, uh, WAFs on top of uh, AWS. And I'm going to briefly touch on the, uh, um, our recommended uh, architecture for auto-scaling WAF. Um, so let's see how vulnerable we are. Um, and uh, um, the data that you see here is coming from uh, White Hat Security. What I like about their uh, yearly report is that they, they give statistics about specific uh, verticals, industries. So for example, um, if you're in the retail industry, then 59% of the retailers um, are all the time, all year long, have a, a, a critical vulnerability on, the, on public facing application. Um, if you're in the financial industry, then 44% of the financials are all year long vulnerable. Um, the best, the, the, you know, the industry that, that do best is, is actually the, the, the healthcare. And in this case, only 39% of the healthcare providers are uh, vulnerable all year long, 365 days a year. 
Another interesting uh, uh, um, data point is that on average, it takes a, an organization 129 days to close, to fix a critical vulnerability in web applications. Um, and if we're talking about uh, not critical, only high uh, uh, or, or medium vulnerability, then we're talking about more than six months. Um, I recommend you to read the full report and use it to get resources uh, with your upper management. Use that report to, uh, um, to get the, the, what you need in order to protect your web application. It's a very good report. Uh, but this is not all. If, uh, um, when Ver Verizon um, basically analyzed the breaches of 2016, they saw that 77% of uh, the attacks carried by botnets, 62%, um, for example, exploited known vulnerabilities, and 32% exploited SQL injection. So we realized that this is a real problem that we need to address. And, um, you know, one solution is, is to fix the code. Um, but fixing the code is not always easy. Um, it's not always something that you can do fast enough. Uh, and sometimes the vulnerability exists in a, in a third-party library that you cannot fix the code. And patches are not available. So another solution to solve these vulnerabilities, these issues, is by using a web application firewall. And web application firewalls today have four main areas of responsibility. The first one is to deal with web exploits. So things like SQL injection and cross-site scripting and cross-site request forgery and command injections. And this is where the WAF market really started. Um, web application firewall are, are using multiple techniques to solve these issues. Um, they look at the RFC, you know, they look at the protocol level, they scan the request with known attack signatures, and they can also deploy more advanced uh, uh, um, techniques like whitelisting the URLs or whitelisting the parameters and their values. Um, another important feature of web application firewall is their capability to scan the outgoing responses of the web application. And we do that from, from two reasons. The first reason is that you don't want to leak out any sensitive information. Okay, so if you have an application, for example, that is subjected to PCI compliance, the one thing that you want your WAF to do is to make sure that credit card numbers are not leaving the web application, right? The second thing, the second reason is that we don't, you don't want to present error messages to the attackers because the attackers are using these error messages to understand how your web application is being built and what kind of uh, uh, infrastructure is behind it. The second uh, uh, area is layer seven denial of service. And when I talk about layer seven denial of service, I don't mean you know, floods of HTTP gets. This is something simple. Um, but when we analyzed uh, uh, um, you know, the attacks in the last two years, we saw that before a layer seven denial of service attack is happening, the attackers are actually profiling the web applications. They are looking for the most heaviest server side scripts, these pages that takes the most resources from the web application, from the app server, from the database. And they do that because they know that if they only send not a lot of requests to these pages, they can still take the application down to its knees. And they can do that uh, with the traffic that goes below the radar. So good web application firewalls today um, will be able to detect these layer seven denial of service. Um, they will be able to first of all, automatically categorize these heavy URLs for you in an automated way and put these heavy URLs into protection as soon as they sense that there is a, a denial of service condition. And the second thing is that, they all, that a good web application firewall will always monitor the health of the application behind it. It will look at the latency, it will look at the web server queues, 
and it will know when the application is really under a denial of service condition. This is important to do because if you only base your layer 7 denial of service based on static thresholds, um, you will not be able to always differentiate between an attack and a successful marketing campaign. Another important reason to do that is because anytime you deploy any mitigation technique or blocking capabilities, then you have a chance to run into false positives. And if you measure the application air health behind you and only deploy the mitigation techniques, only when the application is really under a denial of service condition, you avoid these false positives. The third area of responsibility is automation attack. So you remember the story that we started with, that uh, um, credit uh, um, reporting agency? They were detected by an automated scan. Their server was detected by an automated scan. So if the only thing that they would turn on is just the uh, um, anti-bot capability, they would probably survive because their server wouldn't show up as a vulnerable server. And another thing is that as soon as you deploy an anti-automation technique, you make the attackers work much harder. They cannot use any more automated tools. Anything that they need to do is, is by using the keyboards with their fingers. Web application firewalls are, are, are today are, are dealing with automation attack. They, in order to deal with automation attack, you have to deploy multiple techniques. So the first thing that you can, that web application firewalls do is scan the request for a known bot user agent. Then they scan then the request with known attack signatures. Then they would go and uh, differentiate between browser activity to script activity. Eliminate any non-browser activity from the web application. And then they would go even deeper and analyze the interaction between the entity that is driving the browser um, and the browser. So basically understand who is driving the browser. Is it a bot or is it a human being? And then they would go even further and infect the browser with sticky cookies, with device IDs. So even if there is a highly distributed attack of a bot that only send one request, disconnect, uh, send another request from a different IP address, the WAF will be able to understand that this, hey, this is the same bot and will be able to block it. The, the fourth category is business logic attacks. Um, an example for that is, think about a, 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 you're running a, a, a website for, a, a, I don't know, a theater, and there, are, and there is a bot that is adding seats into the shopping cart, but never check out. And think about 10 bots that are doing, that are adding, each one of them is adding 20 tickets to the shopping cart and never checking out. That show is going, you know, it's going to lose a lot of money, right? So modern web application firewall can deal even with this kind of sophistication. I'm going to share with you, so we understand what web application firewall is, what it can do. Let's talk about a few best practices. Um, the first one is, is to prioritize your web applica your, your, your application. You know, start with the application that have the most risk. Um, then use WAF security templates. Most of the WAFs have today's pre-built security templates that will give you baseline, baseline security. Um, use the, uh, a DAST, dynamic application um, security testing tools, scanners. Good web application firewalls today will take the output of the scanner and will load it into the WAF and the WAF will automatically configure itself at least to the vulnerabilities that the scanner was able to find. I'm going to quickly go over, over you know, two use cases that we see that our customers are using on top of AWS. The first one is for customers who have seasonal traffic and they need to quickly set up a layer of web application firewall for that season. 
We see customers doing that on AWS, so they deploy a layer of web application firewall at AWS. They make sure all the traffic is routed through that layer. And when the season ends, they can collapse that, uh, uh, um, that layer. The second reason that drives customers to do something like that is the philosophy that, they want, that it's better to deal with the attackers in someone else's network. So what a better network to deal with the attackers can be than, than the AWS network, for example, right? It's nice. Um, the second use case is, is really about optimizing the cost and the performance of, of, your, of your web application security. Um, here we see an example of, of, of leveraging the AWS Shield service for volumetric attacks, then leveraging the AWS WAF to scrub out the simple attacks, and leveraging a purpose-built WAF to catch the most sophisticated attacks. And it's even possible to create a feedback loop between the purpose-built WAF uh, and the AWS WAF. So attacks that are bypassing the AWS WAF and are being detected on the purpose-built WAF can be blocked with a, 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 with a customized rule on the AWS WAF. I'm going to you know, briefly uh, talk about the, the auto-scale uh, uh, architecture of F5. Um, I'm not going to go into the details. Uh, everything is documented on GitHub, and I recommend everybody to go there and see the documentation and the cloud formation templates that we have. Um, but this kind of architecture basically delivers four benefits. 